All right, let's get started here. I'm going to be going over your last homework assignments where you're working with two samples. And the key idea here, these uh, last three statistical methods, they're often referred to as the bread and butter of inferential statistics. And that means that they're used so much. And here's why. Just think how many times in your professional career something new comes out. So what are you going to do? Well, you got to decide, is it worth getting the new thing? Or should I keep using what I'm using? So let's just get a little piece of scratch paper up here. Set this up here. Oh, I guess we can put this aside now. Whoops. And uh, so your no hypothesis, remember you're asking yourself how much of a difference is there between the new thing and what I'm currently using? And the null says, how much of a difference? No, there's no difference between the new thing and what you're currently using. Don't waste your time and your money on it. Just keep what you have. And if you don't go with that decision, what other alternative is there? Your alternative. And that means there is a difference. But which inequality? Well, whichever one says that the new thing is better, buy it, invest in it, get it, learn how to use it. It's worth it. So isn't that the, your two choices? So you want to go with whichever choice is most likely to be true. So you're going to be comparing two things. And so that means you're essentially comparing two populations with each other. <laughs> now, your data could be either quantitative numerical data involving measurements, or it could be binary data such as your clients, would they prefer the new thing or would they prefer what you're, what you're currently giving them? But that's the idea. It's gonna be one or the other, those two types of data. And you want to choose uh, the most likely to be true. So you're gonna take a, have a sample, you know, two, you're gonna have two samples. And from that, determine if there is no difference between those two samples or there is a difference between those two samples. Of course, the bigger the difference, the stronger the support for the alternative. Because, and so the burden of proof <clears throat> is on the new thing, that there is a difference. The benefit of the doubt goes to what you're currently using, what you have. But there's going to be countless times that's probably going to come up because there's always new stuff coming up. So what you're covering here this last week may be very, very useful to you in your professional career. So, and the good news is all those concepts you learned last week working with the one sample hypothesis test are carried over. Now, it is true, let's move this over here, that you probably already got chapter 11.1 done. I'm still gonna go over that because maybe you were working on it and you were having a hard time with it and didn't get it done. Well, as I told you on our very first session, you can always submit homework past the due date for full credit. Now, of course, you know, after uh, June 9th, you know, it has to be done before the final exam. There's no point in doing homework after the final exam. So, you know, as long as uh, any homework that's turned in by June 9th, doesn't matter how far back. So you might look, see if you're missing any homeworks. You know, doing any missing homeworks will just help you review for the cumulative final exam. And that's uh, not that far away, is it? That's uh, next week. This week, we're covering the last of the techniques. And of course, after you cover those, then you can just start reviewing for the final exam. The best things to do is look back at your exam one and see what mistakes you made, see if you can learn from them. Now, 
I don't know if you've considered this, but I wanted to mention it to you. And hold on here, let me a little adjustment here. Now do remember now, back on exam one, you did one of these versions. Well, what you should do is go back to whichever version you did do, get a copy of that exam, and then pretend you're taking the test, see if you can remember all of that stuff. Okay. And if not, then uh, review what you messed up on. And then you can see how well you're doing by doing the other version. Because you got the answers key there. And then do this after you do that for exam one, then do the same thing for exam two. Start with the version that you took, retake it, see if you're, you're doing better on it now. Hopefully not worse. Uh, but learn from any mistakes and then take the other version and use the answer key to see how you're doing. And those of you who turned in the hypothesis test assignment on time, you got the, your feedback on that back today, this morning. And those turning in late, well, you'll get it back sometime later, that's all. So uh, that's the plan. So let's start talking about the new stuff. Now, let me show you this. And oh, I should remind you that all these documents I'm showing you, as you know, as we've done countless times in our past sessions, you have them available to you. You go to external links, files from the live lectures, and this is session nine. So I'm gonna be taking a look at this summary for two independent samples. Talk about that. And then I'll specifically talk about when they we have dependent ones. But I'm going to start with this because it's a nice overview. All right. In fact, let's make this a little bigger. I can move that aside here. Out of the way. All right. So as we look here. On the left hand side of this bar line, you dare not cross because you don't want to mix up quantitative data with binary data. That would be bad. So, oh, and let's talk about this. Um, I'm going to bring my scratch paper back. Is remember back when you were learning about regression and that was on exam one? And we told you, you cannot use regression to show that there's cause, that one variable is causing the other. Well, how can you establish cause, or it's sometimes called a causal relationship? Uh, evidence. That one variable is causing the other one to be what it is or to have what value it has. How do you do that? Well, it's done with a randomized double blind controlled experiment. This is the gold standard. So this word right here, that means, first of all, let's suppose, and so this double blind experiment, that could either be done with quantitative data or binary data. But this right here is a classic application that we would be doing either here's quantitative or binary data with two samples. So if you're trying to show one variable is causing the other, you got to set up this experiment. And this is how you got to set it up. We could do a classical clinical trial if you'd like. And that would be that a new treatment has come out and we wonder if it's effective. And of course, we let the public know about this new technique and how promising it is, and they get all excited about it because they that sounds like something they really need. And we let them know in that article that if they 
contact these us, these people that um, they might get on a clinical trial and they'll get the um, treatment for free. And of course, they, they're all excited about that. So they contact them in hopes that they'll get included. And so we have these willing participants. And as these willing participants come in, we randomly assign them to groups. Now, for simplicity, let's just do two groups. Now, we, we don't let them know we're doing this, okay? This, they don't know we're doing this, but we're randomly assigning them to two groups. And one of them is going to be the treatment group. And the other is going to be the control group. So that's where the control comes in. We have a control group. See, the treatment group, they're actually going to get the treatment that uh, they're all expecting to get. The control group, they just think they're getting it, but they're really not. <laughs> but we have to do this for the placebo effect. And we've learned we have to account for this, and this is how we account for it. There's a certain proportion, people who just respond favorably because of their, I guess, their positive outlook, they're optimistic, they're all excited about getting this treatment, and just the thought alone is making them feel better and respond favorably. So, um, but this way, we can say, see if there's a difference between those who actually got it and those who thought they got it. And it, it allows for the placebo effect. So you've got to do that. Now, this randomly assigning to groups. Now, this is almost magical what it does. Because if you magically assign to groups and your groups are big enough, what happens is those two groups are very similar. They're not exactly the same, but they're similar. So if you're concerned about some aspect of one group having a certain characteristics, we say, don't worry about it. It'll be the same proportion over in the other group. They're gonna be similar. But, but what did these people in the uh, treatment group don't take their medicine like they're supposed to? Eh, don't worry about it. It'll be about the same proportion over here. They're gonna be similar because their differences average out if and only if you randomly assign them to groups, you're equally likely to go to either one. It's, it's almost too good to be true. If you think about it, of all the confounding uh, factors that are you don't have to worry about. Because the only difference between these two groups is they got the treatment and they didn't. Every, everything else about them just averages out because we randomly assign them to groups. Now, let's talk about the double blind. Well, first of all, we're not letting these participants know we're assigning the group. And we're certainly gonna let the, not let them know there's a control group that some people aren't actually getting the treatment. They just think they are. They don't need to know that. We're gonna keep them blind to the fact. Now, the other one to watch out for, and this is a little more subtle. Now, we definitely have people who are keeping track who's in which group, but the people who interact with these people who are taking the measurements or asking how they're feeling and gathering the data from them, they must not know that there's two groups either. Otherwise, they're liable to even subconsciously treat these people differently. We can't have that. So that's double blind. Those who interact with these people, the participants and the particip participants themselves. So that's the double blind control because we have a control group, randomized because we randomly assigned to groups. Now, you do not start with a random sample because that would be unethical. You can't just randomly grab people and force them to take a medical treatment. It's just wrong. So, yeah, but by randomly assigning to groups, you're doing the best you can. And randomly assigned to groups is very, very important in order for the differences between the two groups to average out. Anyways, I want you to keep that in mind because that's a very, very important thing. And if you're ever reading a study that's being done and they're trying to see if there's a causal relationship that this treatment is causing people to respond favorably, 
these are the things you'd want to ask. Oh, okay. Did, did you, you had a control group? Okay. Okay. And did you randomly assign to groups? If they didn't, then just forget the whole experiment. It's, it's not worth anything if they didn't do that. Now, uh, now I'm sure the uh, participants were blind, but the people interacting with them, were they aware of which group each person was in? Because that could definitely undermine the entire experiment. You'll know the right questions to ask. All right. So anyways, you've heard about controlled experiments way back in chapter four. Now you got the full story. So imagine this being done either over here or over here. You know, like this would be the treatment group, that would be the control group. And uh, N would be the size in this group, would this be the size in this group, don't necessarily have to be the same size, but you'll get your sample mean, sample standard deviation of these measurements, sample mean, sample standard deviation of these measurements. Now you don't expect those sample means to be exactly the same, but they're your estimates of these population means. So you want to know, is there a statistically significant difference between my sample means, which would infer there's a significant difference between your population means. And now you'll notice that your null hypotheses are easier to do when you've got two samples. The null value is always zero. The difference between your two parameters is always zero. Now you could write it this way for the null, or you could write it this way. Now, when you're, it's better to write it this way, it helps you more to write it this way when you're entering into your calculator. But when you follow it up with a confidence interval, this makes more sense. Now you're gonna to have to think a little differently about your confidence intervals. We're not trying to find a confidence interval for a single population mean, we're trying to get an estimate of the magnitude of the difference between my two population means. How different are they? That's what you're trying to find the value of. So that's a little different from what you were doing last week. Now, the, and of course, whichever inequality the researchers are in goes there. And of course, if it is binary data, let's suppose your test, you know, either you're, you're feeling you know, better or you're not feeling better. That's binary data. So you want to know if people are responding or not responding significantly. And so that's what the data they're, they're gathering from these participants. And the null says there's no difference between these population proportions. And the alternative says, oh, yes, there is. And so, uh, this is a great document to review. It reminds you, you want to use two sample t-tests. Now, the key thing here is that these two samples are not matched or paired up in any way okay. because you just randomly assign to the two groups here. And the same is true here. These are independent samples. They're not matched or paired up. Now, here's the questions you ask yourself to know that you're supposed to be using this statistical method. The first question, notice, for, same for both of them. What do they want from me? Well, hopefully you, you got, had some practice last week recognizing, yeah, hypothesis tests are different from anything else. I got to choose between two choices, two ideas, two hypotheses, or I'm testing a claim. And now how many samples were taken? Now this is, you know, a newer one. Um, Two samples, look, either it's one sample or two sample. That's all we cover. Now, of course, if you take another term of statistics, you'll learn about where you take three or more samples. But for us, it's just one or two. And these are examples where you have two. Um, now, what type of data is it? Is it quantitative data or binary data? Um, now, over here for quantitative data, one last question. Are these two samples matched or paired up in some obvious way? Because if not, then by default, they're independent samples. So if they're not matched or paired up, then they're independent samples and we use this method. If they are matched and paired up, this is the wrong method. 
got to use the one from the previous chapter you were doing last week. Over here, you say, hey, how come they don't ask if dependent or independent here? Because all we cover are independent for binary data. There actually is dependent for binary, but it, it's pretty rare, isn't really usually needed very often. So it's really not worth us covering it. Hey, we just cover the super, super most important stuff you want to know. Now, there's still more you want to know, which is why you, you would do want to take a second term of statistics. We get you off to a good start, but you, you really do want to know more than this. All right, um, so let's, what I'll do is, I'll come back to this. I'm going to cover working with a matched pairs. That's when you have quantitative data and you'll be answering these same questions. What do they want from me? How many samples? What type of data? But the answer here will be dependent samples. So let's cover that. Then I'll come back to this document. We'll cover independent samples for quantitative data, then we'll cover this one. So these one, two, three, these are the last three statistical methods we're covering. And I'm going to cover them right now. So what I think I'll do is I'm going to go over to the uh, homework for that chapter. Let's see, I think I can get rid of this one. I could probably get rid of that. And let's get over here. Go over to the homework. And so remember, if you're missing any homeworks, you know homework is 15% of your grade, right? If you go to our syllabus, 70% is exams. 15% is quizzes, but those are done and passed. Nothing you can do about those. But if you're missing any homework, you really should uh, do that. Or if you didn't get 100% on it, go in there and redo it. You remember, you can click on similar problem, that little button at the bottom, and redo it to get a good percentage. So, you know, that'd be a shame not to take advantage of that. And get some extra practice while you're at it. So let's go over here to dependent samples. And question one is a good one. I'll make that a little bigger just so you can all read it a tad bit better. Um, and why this is so good is because really match pairs is really the actually only real reasonable way to do this. Because this researcher takes some measurements of water clarity and he wanted to do the same locationally because some, some might be cloudier than others and others clearer than others. And the same dates because different times of year the water could be more cloudy or more clear. Um, and repeats the measurements on the same dates five years later. So to see there's a, a change after five years. The researcher immerses a weighted disc painted black and white and measures the depth in inches of which is no longer visible. So the bigger the measurement, the clearer the lake is. The smaller the measurement, the more murky the lake is. So the collected data is given in the accompanying table. Let X represent the initial depth and Y represent the depth five years later. Complete parts A through C below. And then it says, uh, click the icon. And there's our data. Now, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this data, uh, X into list one and the Y data in list two on my calculator. So let me just bring this on up. I'll scoot it over here. So let's see, I'll press stat, one for edit, clear anything that's in there. And we got to get the it in this in the proper order. So let's see, 34. 
Okay, let me go and take that net. Then I'll go over here and put in the depth five years later. And I'm going to double check myself. I'm going to move my little thing down. Let's zoom in a little more here. That might be hard for you to see this. All right, so. Now, the idea here is now, notice that why are these dependent samples? Because in this first sample, the time of year and location had already been determined. So uh, since once that was already determined, then that determines what's going to be over here, because this has to be at the same time, same location that I gather this measurement from. So these are matched and paired up with each other, each pair, because they're the same location, same time of year. And that makes sense, because if they were independent, then that means we would just have taken a random sample of measurements in the lake. Ah, who knows what location, any old location will do, any old time of year will do. And then same thing over here five years later. Ah, pick any location you want. Who cares if one area is murkier than the other? And who cares what time of year? Who cares if it's murkier one time of the year? You see, this real this situation is not cut out for independent samples. It just isn't as good. It doesn't lend itself well for that. So, but match pairs is perfect. Now, um, I need to go over here. And I need to read carefully how they want me to, what to be subtracted from what. Now, this is, you don't have to worry about this on an exam for me. Okay? But in order for this homework to be able to grade you, it need, you need to do it a certain way, a way it tells you. Um, so, oh, yes, yeah, let's answer the first question. Why is it important to take the measurement on the same date? Those are the same dates. All biologists use to take water. Oh, that's silly. Using the same dates makes the second sample dependent on the first. That's what, true. Uh, but also there's more other reasons, you know, is that, you know, the, the time of year, the clarity can be different. So you want to use the same time of year. But A is a bad answer. B is a decent. Oh, I click on continue. There we go. Now, does the evidence suggest the clarity of the lake is improving? Okay. Now, they want us to, and I'm going to scoop this over here. So what they want us to do is we're looking at the differences between our two matched pairs. They want us to do y minus x. Okay. Now, as you might recall, and if you don't recall, then let's just bring it back again. I wonder why it doesn't bring, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Anyways, we had put, uh, this was the five years later. And this was five years ago. You could sort of think of this as being the, um, this being the before and this being the after. So five years ago and now. 
Now, um, if the clarity on the lake is improving, which measurement is higher, this one or this one? Well, the clarity is improving. That means you can see the disk farther down. So the after measurements will be bigger. And the before will be smaller. Now, when you take a big number and subtract a smaller number, is the result a positive or a negative number? It's one or the other. Okay. So 10 minus 2 is a positive 8. So it's a positive. So these differences should be overwhelmingly positive values rather than negative values. And how do positive numbers relate to zero, which inequality goes here between positive numbers and zero? Positive numbers are bigger. So that's our differences. We think our differences are going to be positive. So that means all of this is to make sure I don't get it confused and mixed up. If you try to do this in your head, it can be rather confusing. So just write it out. Just take it one step at a time, clarify which one is which, Ask yourself which one is bigger, which is smaller. And from there, you can tell whether your differences are positive or negative. If I had smaller minus bigger, then this would have been less than zero. So our null hypo hypothesis is always that the population of differences equals zero. That's always your null, always, always. And then our alternative Which inequality goes there? Well, that's what I did all of this work for, to figure out that my differences are going to be positive, so that this should be positive in there. Now, let's go over to our calculator, because see, we're going, oh, they want us to use this significance level. We're going to have to run t-test on the differences between our matched pairs. And we're going to get those in list into list three. Whoops, I meant to, didn't mean to go off the screen there. All right, so let's bring the calculator on over here. There we go. All right, so this is how you do it. So I'm going to be pressing my arrow keys. These are right here. So I'm going to press my right arrow, get over there. I have to press the up arrow to get up there to highlight L3. Now, what we've got to do, because remember what we did. Um, we want to do um, L, because this we put in list two, we got to do list two minus list one, don't we? Because we put the five years later in list two and we put this in list one. So that's what I'm going to have to do over here. I'm going to have to essentially do is get this L2 minus L1 right in here. How do I do that? Well, to get the list two, Press the second key, that's this one right here. And then you're going to press the two key to get list two. So when you press the second key and two, list two shows up right there. Then hit the subtract key, then press the second key and the one key to get list one. Then you hit the enter key and look, it calculates all the differences. Now, of course, you had a movie in uh, your learning module showing you how to do all of that. We'll show it again. So all we got to do is run t-test on list three, these differences. Now, we could um, run one of our stats on this and get the sample mean, sample standard deviation, but it's just simpler to do it this way. So we're going to press stat and press get over to test and go over to t-test. Now, isn't this odd? 
we got two samples and yet we're using t tests which we think of as just being one samples but when you got matched pairs it boils down to just one sample of differences and that's what we're going to run t test on so you probably have stats highlighted but press the left arrow highlight data and then press enter to select it now what is our hypothesized value for the population mean of differences? Always zero. Do we want list one? No, we don't. List two? No, we don't. Who do we want? List three. So press your second key and three to get list three in there. Frequency is always going to be one. And let's see, which inequality did we have? We had the greater than. So I need to go down here, highlight this one, the greater than, hit enter. So key things, this is always zero for match pairs. You're always gonna have your differences in list three. Frequency is always gonna be one. So those are always gonna be the same for these types of problems. The only thing that will change is which inequality. Then go down, highlight, calculate and hit enter. All right, there's our test statistic. Hey, in fact, I'm gonna do my little sketch. You know that thing that all my A++ students do. Like I was showing you last week with the one samples, it still applies here and it's very helpful. Now this is a picture of what would happen if the null hypothesis is true. You go out one, two, three tick marks. One, two, three. Now, our now I'm not going to put an X bar or P hat here. That's only for one sample, uh, one population. But we've got two samples. Sure, it boils down to one, but we started with two. That we put the test statistic here. Now. See that zero, that's our null value. That goes right there. But you already know that for the T distribution. Now, the idea is we want to know if this the difference is, is going to be positive. Is it just going to be that much positive? Because if it's just that much, that's not unusual, is it? Why you just, that was exactly what you expect to happen if the null hypothesis were true. So it's just a little bigger. You know, you're going to, it's obvious you stick with the null hypothesis. But if it's way far away, like way out here to the right, then it's obvious that you're going to go with the alternative. Those are the no brainers, where it's obviously close, obviously far away. But what if it's somewhere between? You're not so sure. Well, where do we draw the line? Well, that's what this tells us. Because remember, the farther away you go, see the area to the right of my pencil? That tells you how unusual it is to get to a test statistic that far away or farther, that area to that right. And the farther away you get, the smaller that area gets. That area to the right is your p-value. So if you get so far away that the area to the right there is this small or smaller, you've got sufficient evidence to support the alternative. So we're reusing the same concepts that we had learned when we were just working with one population. And those just keep getting reused over and over again. So our calculator, let's see what they told us. The, our test statistic, oh, let me move this up so you can see it. Then we get a test statistic and we ask ourselves, huh, what are the chances of getting a test statistic that extreme or more extreme of the null hypothesis is true? Oh, well, that's what the p-value tells you. And our test statistic was a 0 0.97. What did that, what does that mean? 97%? No, that's not a percentage. That's like a z-score. Hey, you were less, that's just under one standard error away. Is that unusual to be one standard error away? Heck no, it isn't. Look how big that area is. That's a, a kind of a big probability. 
to only be that far away or farther. I'd say that could qualify as a no-brainer for sticking with a no, but we're going to complete the job here. How big is this probability right here? Well, that's your p-value. And they're telling us the p-value is zero point. Let's see, my calculator says 1879, but that actually rounds up to 80. So every time you get the p-value, here's what you should do interpret it as if you're teaching it to someone else. Hey, look, there's an 18.80% probability of getting a test statistic this extreme or more extreme if the null hypothesis is true. Is that unusual? No, that's not unusual. That's a big probability. That's way bigger than our 5% significance level. Our p-value is so big it is bigger than our significance level. And so we got no reason to doubt the null. Are we rejecting the null? No, we have failed to reject the null. We got no evidence against it. So there is not sufficient evidence to support the alternative hypothesis. Oh, hey, let's go ahead and answer the questions they have here for us. Let's see now. I might need to make this a little bigger so we can see these. Now, you never ever put an inequality in the null hypothesis, never ever. So that automatically disqualifies A, B, and F. Those aren't even remotely correct. Now, the question is really between D, E, and C. And this is why we went to all that work to make sure we had the correct inequality. Because if you had the wrong inequality, the whole thing is messed up. So once again, this is what we did. That was going to be greater than zero because we were doing the uh, after measurements and subtracting the before measurements from. It. And if the clarity is improving, this is what it would be. Now we gotta take our P value and round that off. And so on my calculator, that was the 0.188. So notice there's no percentage there. So I know I have to enter as the decimal. Now choose the correct. Uh, there is sufficient evidence? No, no. Um, it's not reject, not to reject that. So hopefully the last one is D here. This is our only hope. True, we do not reject it and putting it in co um, context, in context is there is not sufficient evidence to support the alternative, which is to conclude that there has been improvement in clarity of the water. So that is the one that we concluded. Now draw a box plot. All right, so let's make a box plot. So this would be a good thing to review. I mean, you need to review this anyways for the uh, final exam. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna check for the two pitfalls. So press Y equals, make sure, uh oh, I can't have any of this going on. So I'm gonna have to press clear there. That's from a college algebra class I'm teaching. So I have to clear those. Now the other thing to check here is press second y equals. And we want all the plots off. They don't say plots off. I mean, if these all three aren't all off, you'd go down here, select four and hit enter. So they are all turned off. Now that you got that, press the second key and y equals. Let's select one for plot one. Press enter to turn it on. Hit your down arrow. Let's go over here. And do we ever use this one? Never, never, ever use that one because that doesn't tell you you have outliers. Only use this one. So hit enter to select it. Do we want list one? No. List two? No. We want list three. 
That's where our differences are. So you press the second key in three. Frequency is always set to one. Looks like we're all set. Now, what keys do we press to get a nice viewing window? We press the zoom key and nine for zoom stat. And there you go. Now, of course, we can press the trace key. Ah, it's shaved off. It's a whisker over there on the left side. But it didn't shave over on the right side. We got a whisker. So it looks kind of funny, doesn't it? Oh, that's because of some small data set. So now let's go take a look, see which one seems to match. Oh, well, that makes it easy because only one of them looks like ours, and that's this one right there. Sometimes they make it where you, can, you really have to look and try and find the differences between them. Does this visual evidence support? So let me get that back and kind of show you why it supports it. See this? That's where zero is. So do you see how our box is straddling zero? Yeah, so zero difference is very believable. Now, if I we had rejected though, accepted the alternative, we would expect this entire box to be either to the right or to the left, depending which inequality we're doing. Oh, in our case, which was greater than, if we had rejected the, no, accepted the alternative, we expect this entire box to be to the right of this, off to the right here somewhere. But that's, but this agrees with our hypothesis. So over here, darn, I did that again, didn't mean to do that. There we go. And we'll say yes. Oh, and before we do that, let's, they didn't have you do this, but in actual practice, you would want to see, run a confidence interval on the difference. So, and it's so easy to do. You've done all this hard work to enter that data. It'd be a crime not to follow up with a confidence interval. So if we just did T test, which confidence interval do you follow up with? T interval, that's right. So whoops, we'll go over to T interval, highlight data, L3, that, and 0.9 would be the appropriate one to use. Highlight, calculate, hit enter. So what we're talking about is the population mean of the differences what would that be equal to? In other words, we did every location on that lake. That's right, every location. And we got all the possible matched pairs. Boy, that sounds impossible. But if we did it and we calculate the mean of all those differences, what would it be equal to? Well, we got it narrowed down to somewhere between about an almost negative four to a little over 11. So you can, so you have some idea of the magnitude of how narrowed down you have. It's not very narrowed down, is it? This is telling you something very valuable. You need a larger sample of matched pairs. You just don't have it narrowed down enough. No wonder we fail to reject the null. Any of these values between here and there would not get rejected. You know, obviously zero is the one we're interested in. But if you had gotten a larger number of match pairs, it might be very likely you would have found a difference and you would have had a good idea what the magnitude of that difference was if you had taken more samples. Well, you should have thought of that five years ago. It's too late now, isn't it? So if you're going to do a longitudinal study like this, Make sure you're doing a large sample so you don't end up like this. Whether you realize, oh, gosh darn it. Uh, I, I don't have the accuracy we need here to get a good idea. Because, you know, maybe it is improving and we don't know because we didn't get a large enough sample size. Well, there's a word to the wise, something to be thinking about. All right, so that's match pairs.
So now let's talk about when we don't have match pairs, when they're independent. So I'm going to go back to that other document. That aside. Oh, not you. I just clicked on the wrong one. There we go. So now, if you've got two samples, and the idea is Let's suppose you're comparing two populations with, with each other. Not necessarily the randomized double blind control experiment, but you actually got two populations. And you want to know if they're the same or different. Just take a random sample from this one and a random sample from that one. And they're, they're independent. There's nothing in there that has them matched or paired up in any way whatsoever. They don't even have to be the same sample size. Now, if this data you're gathering is quantitative, that's this word. If it's binary data, because you're categorizing, you're going through your sample, and either they're in the category of interest or they're not, that's over in this world. So it's going to be one or the other. So we'll look at some examples of this. So let's scroll down. So imagine walking into the classroom. And your professor has set up at each table how to do an analysis to see which brand of paper towels is indeed the best one. Oh, I got a plug. I didn't realize I didn't have my uh, laptop plugged in. Whew, thank goodness for the warning. That would have brought an abrupt end to our little uh, get together here. It's a good thing they this watches out for things. I was completely oblivious. I see it now. I think, oh boy, I didn't have much time left. And hold on here. Oh, good. Yeah, it's charged. Just want to assure myself that I'm showing that uh, charge symbol. Okay, now let's see here. So we're looking at these two students. They got some quantitative measurements to do. Oh, by the way, well, could you do a census to see which paper towel is the most absorbent? Well, you'd have to take every piece uh, ever made uh, in existence of each of those paper towels. And after you soak it in water and measure uh, how it's absorbency, it just doesn't work quite as well anymore after that. You really can't reuse a paper towel very well, can you? You used up all the paper towels. So they, look, there's no way you could do a census. The only thing you can do is use inferential statistics. So thank goodness we have inferential statistics. So we can find out which brand of paper towels is most absorbent. Now, maybe that's not something you're interested in, but this is to some it might be. But the idea is, is that then you're going to apply this to something you are interested in, such as you've got two brands to choose from and one you're currently using and there's the other new one that came out and you want to decide who's better. Well, how are you going to decide it? Well, either with quantitative data or binary data, depending on the data you're gathering from those two things. But this is a good example as any here. So we're gathering this data. And now before we even ever, ever look at the data, and this is an important concept, is you're supposed to set up your hypotheses before you got your data. So I keep moving that. So let's get this over here. Scoot my paper up there. So here's what you're supposed to do. What is our null hypothesis? Whoops, I need to hit the focus. There, that's, yeah, that'll work. 
and our alternative. So what's our null and what's our alternative? Well, we got quantitative data. So it's going to be involving means. So we got two brands. There's the average absorbency of brand X. That's a population mean. And the average absorbency of brand Y. The null says there's no difference between them. Oh, well, that means they're equal. Yeah, and of course, we always have the equal sign in there. So that's always the null, that they're the same. Now, it can be written like this, that if you took these equal measurements, these equal population means, rather, subtracted them from each other, you would get zero, zero difference. Now, which inequality, so you copy down everything except for the equal sign, notice that doesn't change. Which inequality, a greater than, a less than, or not equal? And you're saying, well, what do we know about these? Is one thought to be better? And I'm saying we know nothing. We have no preconceived whatsoever about which one being better than the other. Well, then there's only one logical thing to do here, isn't there? We just want to know if they're different. This is the most common inequality in your alternative hypothesis. Because usually, general, we have no preconceived idea in a situation like this. Now, of course, if you're comparing something you're currently using with a new thing, then your inequality would be whichever is saying that the new thing is better. So that, that, that would make sense to have a less than or greater than. But in this situation, no preconceived idea. Now, when we followed up with a confidence interval, that will tell us the magnitude of the difference between them. Now, if brand Y is better, then my lower bound and upper bound will both be negative if this is better. But if brand X is better, then my lower bound, upper bound will both be positive. So you notice that the lower bound, upper bound, their signs are the same if zero is not in there. But if your lower bound is negative and your upper bound is positive, that's when this happens, because that's what when you contain zero. Uh, you know, you know about the number line and how that works. So that's you set this up before you ever, ever gather the data. So with that being the case, let's go take a look here at the data. Now, if you were to look at the data and want to set up your alternative, you might be tempted to say, oh, oh, looky here, this is bigger. So why don't I make a population uh, mean for Y bigger than this one? And you have just broke, violated a very sacred rule. You never look at your sample to decide which inequality to put in there because it's despicable. That's what it is. All right. All right, and then, of course, we're going to follow up with a 95% confidence. Interval. So we see that, you know, it doesn't surprise us. Sample means aren't exactly the same. But is that statistically significant? And so hypothesis test only tells us if there's a statistically significant difference. It's not until we look at the confidence interval, we can get a handle on whether the difference is of practical significance. Or if uh, our sample wasn't big enough, because things aren't narrowed down enough. So a confidence interval always gives you good, helpful insight. It's a crime not to follow up with a confidence interval. A sin and a shame, you might say. All right, so we got all that. These are not matched or paired up in any way. These are two independent samples. So do you think we might have enough of what we need to set this up? I'm going to have to zoom out here a little bit. All right, so let's pre press stat, go over to test, and this is a job for two SAMP t-tests. We got two samples. It's t-test because the population standard deviations are unknown. That's why we're using the sample standard deviations. So we'll just go in there 
and highlight stats, hit enter, and just fill in what they're prompted for. So what's our sample mean one? That's our 3.0. So, so this is our brand X. And so sample standard deviation is 0 0.9. Sample size 50. So by the way, these are random samples and independent. We got large sample sizes, at least 30. So the conditions are met. Now the, the sample mean is 3.5. And this is 1.2. And our large sample size of 50. And we'll highlight the not equal, hit enter. Then you see this funny question, really just ignore it. By default, it says no, and we would always have it say no. And then what that is, it's asking you, if I said yes, I'd be saying that I know that the population variances, which is a very sensitive measure of variability or spread, is the same for these two. And I don't know that, so I always put no for this. And so will you. So just leave it on no and don't give it a second thought. Highlight, calculate, and hit enter. Okay, so we got our test statistic, our p-value, and I want to make my sketch. Of course I do. I think I can scoop this over a little more. So if that null hypothesis is true, one, two, three, one, two, three, and put a T here, zero there. Hey, he said that looks just like the one you did for match bears. Yeah, yeah, it does. If the null hypothesis is true, because, you know, they both use the uh, same test statistic. Um, T, but the way it's calculated is vastly different if you looked at your uh, textbook. Now, so we're going to, and it's always a good idea to document what you use. So we're using two sample. So this is always a good idea to do on an exam. I'm sure that you use a correct statistical. That way I know you use a correct statistical method. Now, if you put the inputs in wrong, you'll have the wrong test statistic p-value and maybe conclusion. But if you didn't do this, I wouldn't know whether you even knew the correct statistical method or not. So always, always do that. It's for your own good. You always have that good. Now we're going to get a test statistic. And my calculator is telling me that that is a negative 2.36. So let's go to our sketch. Where is a negative 2.36? One, two, five, right about there. Does that look kind of far away? It does. I think that's far enough away. I mean, from here down below, it's two and a half percent. So this is less than that. So that, that's a very small area. And that's our p-value. Because that area tells me the probability of getting a test statistic this extreme or more extreme if the null hypothesis is true. Now, this is a two-tailed test. So that means we actually go on both sides because I want to know how unusual this would be this far away or farther, either below or above. So I go that same distance here. But don't worry, the calculator is very smart. This is what it's doing because how unusual it is to be this far away or farther if the null hypothesis is true. Because we're talking about not equal. We're considering significantly below or, or significantly above. So those two areas add up to your p-value, which is 0 0.0206. 2.06%. So that is small enough to be considered unusual because we're using a significance level. 
of 5%. So our p-value is so small, it's smaller than the significance level. So we're going to reject the null hypothesis that there's no difference and accept the alternative that there is a difference. Now, let's follow up with a confidence interval to see the magnitude of the difference. Follow up. And this is another reason to write this down, because we know it's going to be 2 SAM T, and instead of test, it's going to be int for interval. And it's going to be easy. So I press stat, go over the test, keep scrolling down till I find it. There it is, 2 SAM T int. All this is already entered in. All we got to do is enter in our confidence level. We're going to do a 0 0.95, 95%. Highlight, calculate, hit enter. Notice they're both negative. Sometimes the students see that, oh, I did something wrong. That doesn't look right. Nope, that's exactly right. Because we knew that they were both going to be either negative or positive, depending on which population mean is bigger. Now, the fact that they're negative, now look at this. This is, when you're doing a confidence interval, think about this. Now, if x, grand x had been bigger, we'd have a big quantity minus a smaller, and we'd be talking about positive quantities. But my interval is negative. Well, that's because brand y is more absorbent. How much more absorbent? Well. Let's interpret this. Let me write down my interval. I got a negative 0 0.9214 and a negative 0 0.0786. So let's put that in words because, you know, how we say this is different than how we say it when we are just working with one population. We are 95% confident. that the, now this is where it's different. We don't say that the population mean is, no, we say this. What is that? That's the difference between the population means. So now back when we were doing the match pairs, that was the population mean of the differences. That's something completely different from this. You might say, it just sounds like silly semantics to me, but make sure you understand how different it is. Just put this into words. Isn't that the difference between population means? It is. As opposed to the population mean of all the differences between all the matched pairs. Very, very different. So make sure you're not getting those confused with each other. Oh, and it's also very helpful here to clarify what is being subtracted from what. Is between, and we have this negative, 0 0.09214 and a negative 0 0.0786 ounces. Now, let me uh, clarify, because what we're really concerned with are absolute values here. Well, let's just make a little number line here. And this is where zero is. This is outside the interval. And which of these two numbers is closer? Uh, whoops, that is very, very wrong that I just did there. <laughs> very, very wrong. So that's a nine, two, the decimal goes right there. That's almost a whole ounce. This is a very, very small fraction. Of, this is very close to zero. 
probably closer than that. And this is way over here. 0 0.9214. So the difference between our two population means, now just think absolute value. It might be that population Y is just 0 0.0786 of an ounce more absorbent. Or it could be as much as 0.9214, getting close to a whole entire ounce. Now, these students who have these calibrated beakers, what they could do is they could measure out this much water, splash it on top of a table. It's probably just a few drops. And then they could make, carefully measure this out in their calibrated beaker and splash that on another tabletop. And that's probably a whole big splatter of water. And you're looking at a few drops and a big, huge splatter. It's pretty clear the difference could be of no practical significance or of practical significance. What does that tell you about your sample size? It needs to be bigger. And you're saying, come on, Larry. It was, I did 50 of each. My fingers are pruny. Well, I'm sorry. Our confidence interval tells us it's not narrowed down enough. Now get back to work. Do bigger samples. Yeah. These sample sizes were big enough for our conditions to be met but not necessarily to get things narrowed down enough to where we really have a good idea if there's a practical uh, significant difference between them. Not just statistically significant, but practically significant. Because if it's just a few drops, that's not very practical, significantly different. All right, so that moral to the story, always follow up with a confidence in it. Always, always. And plus, it's so easy. You know, it's already entered in your calculator. All right, so that's an example for you of when you have two independent random samples using quantitative data. Now, we're going to do clinical trials over on this example using clinical trials. Because when you're trying to test for side effects, you're going to have your participants coming in and you know you'll probably be gathering all sorts of data from them but one thing you might be asking is so how are you feeling because you want to determine if they're suffering any side effects and so what we're going to look at is um patients or participants who are using adderall um, which is what some people take for who suffer from adhd attention deficit disorder. They just can't focus on their studies. And so let's set up our uh, hypotheses. Before we even look at the data, let's set this up. So we're going to have these participants. We randomly assign them to two groups. So that means that these two groups are going to be very similar. They'll be equally good or equally bad about taking their medicine. So you don't have to worry about that messing things up. The only difference is these people actually are getting the Adderall and these people just think they're getting it. And, you know, we're asking them how they're feeling because there's one side effect we're concerned with and that's nauseousness. Uh, is the proportion of these participants who are feeling nauseousness the same? Or is the proportion who are actually getting Adderall, is that proportion significantly larger? More of these people get feeling nauseousness than the control group. Because if it is, that would be an indication that nauseousness is a side effect of this drug. So our null hypothesis would be, so let's let population proportion one, that would be our treatment group. They're getting the Adderall and population proportion two. Oh, let me scoot that down there. That's the control group. They just think they're getting it. Now, if Adderall is not causing nauseousness, then there should be no difference between these two groups. So they will be equal. Now for alternative, 
what we're trying to find out is Adderall causing patients to feel nauseousness, which inequality would be appropriate here? What we're trying to find out if this proportion is bigger than that one. This would tell us, uh-oh, it looks like you know a significant proportion of people are feeling nauseousness as a side effect. You know, not necessarily everyone, but you know, a significant proportion of them. Because if it's significant, you need to list it as a possible side effect because it affects a proportion of the people. Not all, but a proportion. So this is what your hypotheses would need to look like. Now that we got that, now we can look at the data and enter it in. Hey, by the way, on our calculator, Oh, and we'll use a significance level of 5%. Oh, by the way, uh, let's talk about type 1, type 2 errors. I did 5% because it's a nice balance between type 1 and type 2 errors. And let's do our little sketch over here, which is what would happen if the null hypothesis is true. Now we're going to have a test statistic Z, zero. That zero represents zero difference between these. Now, we're concerned that this is going to be greater to the right, because P1 minus P2 would be positive if this is bigger. All right, now let's suppose that we landed way over here. Whoa, that's a no brainer. We're going to go with the alternative hypothesis. Now, you know, you could be wrong just due to sampling error, right? That's always a possibility. So if you go with this one and you're wrong due to sampling error, is that a type one or a type two? Hint, hint, hint. Ah, oh, it's a type one error. That's right. So what would a type one error be in this case in context? Okay, so we're saying that there is sufficient evidence that this population proportion is bigger. So we're gonna to have to list nauseousness as a possible side effect. And it turned out that we were wrong due to sampling error. So we're saying, yep, yep, it's causing nauseousness. So that means you are telling this person who uh, could benefit from being able to focus in their college classes if they had this, but because you told them that they might feel nauseous, they didn't take it. Oh, no sorry, they didn't take it and they couldn't focus on their classes and they flunked out. Oh no, they're not getting a college degree and they're going to have to do uh, manual labor for the rest of their life. Well, that might be kind of drastic. Maybe that isn't necessarily the end result, but maybe a possibility. So, you know, they might be a little concerned about a type one error. But let's suppose that we just landed just a little ways away. They're not far enough away. So we say, hey, there's no reason to doubt the null we're going to go with this one. Now, we could be wrong due to sampling here. What are the consequences of that? Well, we're telling everybody, don't worry about it. You can take Adderall. It's not going to make you nauseous. Oops, and we were wrong. So we assured you it wouldn't make you nauseous, and you took it, and guess what? You're feeling nauseous. And let's now let's suppose this is uh, when we're back have normal classrooms again. And you have to keep leaving the classroom because you're nauseous. Now, with the remote learning, I guess I wouldn't be so bad because, you know, if it's being recorded, you could always come back to the recording after you uh, had your nauseousness attack. But in a regular classroom, it'd be quite disastrous. You know, you're missing all the lectures because you're always having to leave because you're nauseous. Or you don't even go. You're missing classes because you're nauseous. So that could be dramatic. Well, I don't know. You might think one type of error is worse than the other, but this is a nice balance between those two awful consequences. Now let's go to our calculator. Which one are we going to use? I bet we can deduce it. Press stat, go over to test. It's two samples, so it's going to have a two in front of it. Can't be Z or T because those are for quantitative data. 
Well, the only one less is, left is two prop Z test. That's correct. We're going to use, and of course, you should always document this in your work. Okay. So let's just, now, let's go look at the data now. Oh, there it is in that paragraph. Hey, let's make a little note to ourselves. Let's slide this on over here. So we got two samples. Um, we've got 374 subjects um, in the treatment group. And then in our control group, we've got 210. Those are like pretty big sample sizes. Are sample sizes big enough for this uh, statistical method to work? And if you're saying, yeah, those are both at least 30, you're approaching it wrong. You're confusing the rules for quantitative data with this binary data. So sample size of 30 isn't how we determine it. So, oh, that's right, we got, these are gonna be broken up into two piles, aren't they? That's right. So this one, you're going to have 26 in one pile. Now, if I take 374 from my calculator and subtract 26 from it, I get 348. You got at least 10 in each pile? I do. Now, how about over here? Well, let's see. I got eight over here and 202 over here. Do I have at least 10 in each pile? Oops. We don't. The conditions are not met. At least 10 in each pile, no. Conditions are not met. Now that probably comes as a surprise because when you looked at these sample sizes, you probably feel sure that it, that was big enough, but Turns out, no, you got to have at least 10 in each box. So this is that the easy, intuitive way to check conditions. You can also do it with the formulas, the formula, but you have to apply the formula twice to each of these. But you'll find, oh, no, the conditions aren't met, but we're going to go ahead and do the work anyways. So we got that. Now, so what we need to do is put this into our calculator. So press that, go over to test, Go down to two prop Z test. So let's see. So X1, so this is our treatment group. That would be the 26 out of the 374. We're feeling nauseous. How about the control group? We had eight out of the 210 who were feeling nauseous. Now we need to highlight the greater than and hit enter. Got P1 greater than P2 then highlight, calculate, and hit enter. So let's write down our test statistic and p-value. So let's see, my test statistic was a 1.56 rounding off. Let's put that in our sketch. That's right about there. So how unusual is that? So th it's a one-tail test. So what's the probability of getting a test statistic this unusual or more unusual than all hypothesis is true? Well, our p-value is 0.0598. That's about 6%. 5.98 percent. You want to be more exact. Well, that's not small enough to be concerned. You that's bigger. That is correct. Was it kind of close? Kind of, kind of. You know, six percent is kind of close to five percent. Um, so you know, the close. If it's close, you kind of think of it as marginal results. I wonder, you know, if you had repeated it, could have gone the other way. But 
based on what we got, we have failed to reject the null hypothesis. There just was not sufficient evidence here to support the alternative that this treatment group, the proportion of them feeling nauseousness being significantly larger than that of the control group. But what does this tell you? You need larger sample sizes. This wasn't large enough. You're going, oh man, look how big that was. But hey, it's binary data. You need really large sample sizes with binary data. That's the nature of the beast of binary data. Uh, let's follow it up with 2PropZ int. Oh, by the way, putting this in the context, we say there is not sufficient evidence at the 5% significance level to support this claim that the population proportion one, the proportion of the treatment group feeling nauseousness is greater than that of the control group. All righty here, so we're going to do a 90%. Oh, by the way, do you expect zero to be inside the interval or outside the interval? Well, we failed to reject the null, so zero would be believable. So if zero is in inside your interval, your lower bound will be negative and your upper bound will be positive. Well, let's see if that happens. So we'll press stat, test, scroll down to get the two prop Z in. Whoops, I went past it. There it is. Everything's in there. All we gotta do is put in the 0 0.90. Highlight calculate. So the lower, oh, this is interesting. Now that's scientific notation. So imagine doing that decimal point four places to the left. Is that super, super, super close to zero? It is. Now, technically, our lower bound and upper bound are both positive, but that is essentially equal to zero. That is essentially including zero, because that is super, super, super close to zero. That if you're rounding off, you're saying it's between zero and 6.2%. So, zero is actually a believable value, even though technically it's, uh, this is above it. It's just such a small fraction. So let me write that. Um, once again, 7.6 e to the negative 4. That's times 10 to the negative 4. So that's like taking 7.6 going 1, 2, 3, 4. So that's equal to 0 0.00076. In other words, approximately zero. So we are 90% confident. We're going to be putting into words subtracting these, the difference between population proportions. That the difference between population proportions Now let's show what's subtracted from what. Now instead of using one and two, it's not quite helpful using subscripts. So we know that, oh, this is the group that took Adderall and this is the one that got the placebo. Oh, I didn't mean to put an equals in there. I meant to put a subtract. Is between Now, these are percentages. Um, so that would be 
zero percent and it was 6.2 percent so zero percent is a believable value but it could be that that population proportion of the Adderall was 6.2% bigger than the other. That that was the magnitude of the difference. So the question is, is that a big enough proportion that we'd have to be concerned with warning people that they might possibly? Yeah, I guess that'll have to be up to the researchers. But based on, but it is true, we didn't have a big enough sample size anyways. So maybe when we get a larger samples, we will find uh, a statistically significant difference because it does increase the power of the test. Okay, so we have covered all the statistical methods that you're going to cover in this class. Now, those of you who are going on for another term of statistics, um, now, unfortunately, you biology majors, you have to wait until spring term until Math 244 is offered, because we're doing it right now this term. I am anyways. Um, but you business majors, you're going to be going on to business statistics. You psychology majors are going to psych stats, and maybe you'll take it this summer or maybe in the fall. But brush up on all of this, especially the hypothesis test. So review how to do your hypothesis test, your confidence intervals, review your sampling distributions, because they're definitely going to test you on that uh, to see what you remembered from this class. So you, I want you to walk into that next class with a working knowledge of what you learned in this class. So that's why it's so important that we take a cumulative final so you take a look back at all that you've done. So after you've finished, you know, this, the homework for these statistical methods, just be reviewing every day, you know, what you've been uh, learning, what you have learned. And that's why it's helpful to review those questions you ask yourself. So this is the last thing I'm going to look at here. Call it quits. But how do I know which statistical method to use? So including these new ones we covered, what are they asking for? Well, let's suppose it's a hypothesis test. Okay, well, how do I know which hypothesis test to do? Well, answer this next question. What type of data is it? Now, these two could be interchanged with each other. Um, but what type of data is it? You're used to that being the second question. So let's do that quantitative or binary. Now, your next question, now this is kind of new. This is a, the newer one that's been added, but it's probably the easiest. How many samples do you have? One or two? It's either one or two. So you'll notice what we did today, it was all with two samples. Now, if it, your answer here was two samples and it was quantitative data, you got one more question. Were those two samples matched and paired up like it was with our two samples uh, from that lake? You know, they were matched and paired up. But these last two examples, like with the paper towels, those weren't matched or paired up in any way. They were independent. So yes or no, it's one or the other. Now, if the answer was yes, like with checking the clarity in the lake, then you're going to do t-test on the differences like we did. But if it's like the paper towels and the answer is no, because they're independent samples, you're going to use two sam t-test. Now, if you said uh, it was two samples but binary data, then you're going to do like what we just did using two prop z-test to see if there was a significant uh, side effect of nauseousness with uh, taking Adderall. All right, well, that's it for this session. And we have one last session. We'll use that to review for the final exam. And that's next Tuesday.
So we'll see you there.